Hello, this is Suzanne Butters, and I'm a marketing associate at Burford Capital. I want to welcome you on behalf of the whole Burford team to today's Burford briefing, addressing gender disparity in origination credit. We're delighted to have you join today's presentation, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Before we start, I want to cover a few housekeeping basics. First and foremost, we hope that today's presentation will inspire you to ask questions of the panelists. You can ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing it into the Q&A box that you should see on your screen. Our speakers may answer those questions either during the course of their presentation or during what we hope will be about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webcast. If you have any technical questions, you can also use the Q&A box for that purpose. And with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Emily to take us through today's presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted um, that you're able to join us, and I am especially delighted to moderate this panel with our extremely distinguished speakers today. Um, I'm Emily Slater. I'm a managing director at Burford Capital. I've been with Burford for 10 years, um, and my role at Burford has been many, have been many, but I mostly focus on assessing um, legal risk and underwriting um, investments for across lots of different practice areas um, and identifying high value um, uh, litigation opportunities for investment. Burford is the leader in the litigation finance space globally. We're publicly traded on the LSE uh, and we have a $4.2 billion investment portfolio, including funds under management. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Ellen. Hi, thank you so much, Emily. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, I'm I'm based out of a Singapore office, so it's evening for me. My name is Eileen, uh, managing director of the Singapore office of FTI Consulting. I specialize in corporate finance, in particular the restructuring and insolvency space. I am an approved liquidator and public accountant, so I do take on formal insolvency appointments. FTI Consulting is an independent global advisory business advisory firm. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It is dedicated to helping organizations manage change and mitigate risk. There are 5,700 employees in 27 countries, and I'm very proud to be part of the organization. And with that, I shall hand over to Karen. Over to you. Thanks, Celine, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from the other part of the world uh, in Ontario, Canada. My name is Karen Fellows. I am senior counsel with Steichman Elliott, which is a uh, Canadian corporate law firm. I've been practicing for over 25 years, and I've practiced in three of Canada's major uh, corporate centers, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. My practice is uh, insolvency and restructuring based. Um, I specialize in um, many of the distressed industries in Western Canada, including mining and oil and gas sector. And uh, I was awarded my Queen Council designation this year, so I'm very pleased to be at the stage of the career where my career where I can uh, speak about some of these issues. I should also add that I am the um, Vice of Finance Director with IWORK, the International Women's Insolvency and Restructuring Confederation. And I will now uh, leave it to Sarah to introduce herself. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here speaking with you today. I'm Sarah Link Schultz. I'm a partner at Aiken Gump Strauss Hauer and Feld. We're an international law firm. Um, my specialty is financial restructuring. We always tell everybody that it's a much nicer way to say that we are bankruptcy lawyers, um, which is really at the heart of what I do. I lead our firm's restructuring practice in Texas, and in particular, our oil and gas restructuring practice, which, as you may um, may know, means that I am incredibly busy right now. Um, we have about 100 lawyers in the restructuring practice worldwide. Um, as a firm, our practice is largely creditor-driven, in particular bondholder groups and creditor committees. My particular practice, um, however, is it's much more um, company side than it is um, creditor side and over the last call it five years our firm has seen a shift from maybe 20 percent company 80 percent creditor to much closer to a 50 50 mix 
um, it has restructuring has just kind of taken off. So with that, I'll pass it back to Emily. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm just briefly going to talk about what we'll cover today, and then we'll jump right into the substance here. Um, really, what we're asking the panelists to talk about is to share their insights into top obstacles facing uh, women lawyers and professionals in the insolvency space, uh, tools that women can use to ensure that they're receiving proper rec recognition, um, valuable lessons learned through their own experiences as industry leaders, um, and pragma pragmatic economic incentives practitioners can implement uh, to advance gender equity within their firms. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce the Equity Project, um, which is Burford's initiative, $50 million initiative to um, provide an economic incentive for women lawyers to take leads and win business. Um, we are as we are a litigation finance company, and so we have earmarked a $50 million fund to invest in litigation um, that is women-led, either by senior women um, on the litigation team um, of outside counsel actually um, pr prosecuting a case, um, or uh, by a woman in-house lawyer awarding, uh, awarding the business to outside counsel. Um, with the what equity project, um, women can pitch clients with attractive fee arrangements, pursue leadership uh, positions in significant matters, um, persuade their firm contingency fee committees to take on matters um, that require significant investment by having already secured um, outside um, help in, in um, offloading fees and expenses to the firm and ensuring that the firm is not at risk for uh, full risk for the matter. Um, which can help ease pathways towards origination credit and relationship credit. Um, it also helps women demonstrate their financial savvy and uh, innovation and ambition to bring in new clients and um, to, to find lawyers and work with lawyers that are um, providing the best legal services uh, for the best um, bang for the buck. Um, the Equity Project um, conducted a, a, a study recently of general counsel, and um, we'll briefly summarize it here. We did uh, interviews with over 75 um, senior in-house counsel or general counsel or major corporations um, uh, to understand better what, um, how the how clients are driving diversity. Um, driving diversity with, uh, within firms and outside counsel that they hire and what they can do to help. And, you know, the equity project, the concept of it really is for, um, um, is to provide an incentive for, for counsel to hire um, women as outside counsel. Um, and so we thought that it aligned well to really look at and build on a lot of the um, information and research that has been done that's, that's demonstrated gender disparities between women in terms of uh, compensation and advancement um, um, and talk to general counsel about the diversity in initiatives that they have and how they look at awarding outside business to women. And, and we really found in the study that there were a wide range of, um, a, a wide range of approaches to looking at at gender um, disparities and trying to um, focus on alleviating them, everything from very systematic reviews of um, gender uh, disparities in firms and how much firms have done to put women into leadership roles and having leadership, women in leadership positions on matters to uh, really sort of taking quite a hands-off approach and having, you know, really saying, you know, we hire lawyers based on individual merit and um, you know we really don't want to get involved in the internal workings of a firm so there's a wide range of disparity there although everybody agrees i think that you know women are perform as well or better than men in terms of performance of the work and efficiency of the work um, and that they agree that there's a good business case for hiring women so we wanted to sort of dig into more into um, where those disparities are and how and and what firms are or what clients are doing. Um, so I think one of the big things that we looked at obviously is there's a lot of um, 
there's a, a big range in how firms are addressing gender equity. And one of the biggest gaps, I think, is that is that GCs and, and senior in-house lawyers at higher outside counsel are really not very aware of how origination credit is awarded at firms. And that is really the basis for um, um, for how lawyers advance and um, are awarded both advancement and in compensation at firms. And so I think the, the biggest insight coming out of um, the study is that you know, firms and, and lawyers um, pitching clients and clients at in-house can be more proactive in understanding how origination credit is awarded and making sure that they're supporting the, the work that they're doing and trying to drive gender equity um, by ensuring, you know, that women are getting the credit that they deserve for the work that they're doing. Um, so with that, um, I think we'll push into talking about, um, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling a little bit with the slides here. Uh, we will start um, our panel discussion. Um, and um, um, Aline, I'll start this question to you. And I'd like actually, you know, each of our panelists Sarah and Karen and Aline all work at, you know, relatively different organizations. So I really love to hear from each of them, I think, on each of the questions that we're talking about today. Um, first question is, um, origination credit remains an important metric for advancement of comp and compensation at most firms and other professional organizations. Does the way that um, credit is awarded disadvantage women, and if so, why? And Aline, if you want to kick us off with talking about um, how things work at FTI, I'd love to um, I'd love to get your insights. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. So I think that the short answer to, to this is yes, for two reasons. I mean, firstly, uh, origination credit is typically referral based. So whoever pretty much has that referral, has that referral through the door, uh, get that or, or origination credit. Um, and the thing about uh, this traditional form of uh, referral-based uh, credit is that it tends to reward so-called rainmakers or connectors. And, and these are generally not typically associated with uh, women, if you like. Women tend to, I mean, even like myself, and even at this level, I, I tend to do a lot of delivery work. So what FTI has done quite uniquely is to acknowledge this, that, that women, even at, at certain levels, uh, tend to do a, a more delivery work. So they do give credit for origination and delivery as well. So that is uh, one way that the firm tries to mitigate uh, that, or try to encourage women to step up. Great, thank you. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about your experience at Aiken at a global firm? Sure. Um, so I, I think, let, let me set the table by saying, I think as a, as a general rule, um, Aiken has done a good job of mitigating some of the things that I think do create barriers for women um, as they're seeking origination credit. Um, but I think that they've only been able to do that in partnership with the women at the firm. Um, stated differently, I think that every one of us is responsible for taking control of our career um, and in ensuring that we're getting um, the origination credit. So our, our system is not surprisingly a little bit different than FTIs and every law firm um, looks at origination differently. but. Ours is, um, has a couple of steps um, when you look at origination credit. First is who actually physically opens the file and who gets the credit in the system. Um, but importantly for our system, um, we also have um, an annual review with our compensation partner um, where we have an opportunity to talk about a couple of things. We do it both written and orally. We have an opportunity first to talk about projects where maybe we weren't the person that opened the file, but um, you know it was a team effort to get it open. And we have an opportunity to say to the partner who's going to be in front of the compensation committee for us, um, 
and say to them, you know, this is why I was critical to bringing in matter X, Y, Z, and I think that um, some portion of that origination credit should fall to me, or why I was critical for providing the service um, that, that came in. Um, so we have that opportunity, and then we also have the opportunity to um, say, you know, who helped us? Who, which partners, um, you know, were critical for us in bringing in our matters? Um, what was interesting to me in my path, and I, I, a few years ago now, crossed the line where I've been a partner more than I've been anything else at Aiken Gump and have been more focused on origination credit. Um, what was interesting for my path was really understanding the process. Um, and I think it's critical for anyone who wants to um, advance and ensure that they're getting proper credit to, to really understand the process at your firm. Um, it took me a while, I'll confess, to get brave enough to go to someone that I saw as sort of powers that be um, in my compensation partner and, and sit with them and just ask a lot of questions um, about how does the process work and what does the comp committee value and um, and how do I make sure that I'm getting, that I'm one, being a good partner and two, getting the credit that I'm entitled to. Um, what I would say, and, and I do think this is very much a, a gender issue, um, is that women tend to be pleasers. We tend not to ask those questions. We tend to sort of roll with it um, and just assume that it will all work out. And um, men tend to be, it just as, as a broad generality, tend to ask a lot of those hard questions, um, very forthright. Um, and, and they also tend to be more willing to, um, a little crude, but to pound their own chest, right? And we're less likely to do that. Um, and so my, my experience is that when I was able to um, finally sort of take control of that, and, and really start to ask the questions and dig in and, and want to, um, you know, control my destiny and ensure that I was getting credit for those things that I had done um, and started to ask the right questions. Um, I found that the system did work, um, but I had to understand the system first. And I think that that's an area where, because the system has been architected um, primarily in most firms um, by by males, um, it's a system that is a little harder for women to navigate. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, Karen, you, I think, recently joined Steichman and you've had experience at a, a couple of other firms. I wonder if you could um, provide us with some insights from the various different organizations you've been with over time. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And um, I, I really uh, agree with many of the things Sarah said. And frankly, I wish I was more sort of aware of the need to educate myself early on in my career. I've, I've uh, been at four different law firms of various sizes, all the way from a small uh, boutique firm uh, to a large international firm. And of course, every firm does it differently. But I think, uh, at, to Sarah's point, the, the good way to think about this is, is not just as a firm-specific point in your career, but think about it at the various stages of your career. Um, in my mind, origination credit really um, comes to roost at three major points in a woman lawyer's career or a woman trustee's career um, or a financial advisor, sorry. Um, number one is when you're an associate and you're trying to make partner. Uh, number two is when you are a, a partner and you're dealing with your comp committee. And then finally, and, and this is one that I think people should keep their eye on, is when you want to make a lateral move. Um, a lot of lawyers don't think about that. Uh, they think they're happy at the firm they're with, but there's always opportunities. And when you want to make a lateral move, it's going to be important that you show um, the firm that you're going to that you have a book of business or you have origination credit, um, not simply that you're an integrated part of a team at another organization. So that's something that can really um, help your career um, uh, because there's always opportunities as you go forward. Great, thank you. Um, I, the next question is, and, and I think each of you touched on this a little bit, but it, it would be great if you could go into a little bit more detail. 
is what, um, what can women lawyers and professionals do to ensure they're receiving the proper recognition for matters? Um, Sarah, can I start with you again? Of course. Um, so I, I think that there are a few things that we can do, um, and some of them are, are very practical. Um, one of the things that I do, um, and, and I learned this trick from another woman, uh, is I keep a running list on my computer of things that I've done that have um, been instrumental in a case and things that I've done that have helped bring matters in so that when it gets to the end of the year and you're starting to try to explain to management, the comp committee, uh, for promotion purposes or whatever, um, that you have a, an active list of here are the things that I've done that have been um, instrumental in, in various matters. Another thing that I think women can do is to enlist um, advocates. Um, every single one of us has done work with someone who I, I, I'm confident has come back to you and said, wow, thank you so much, really appreciate that. Um, to the extent that you're comfortable with those people, um, ask them to make sure that others at the firm are hearing that. Um, there's nothing better than to have someone else um, say to your management team, say to another partner, um, that, you know, Karen was wonderful on this project, and boy, we couldn't have gotten there without her. Or Elaine was, was fantastic and instrumental, and we would definitely come back for her services. Um, I think having people hear not from you but from others about the quality of the service that you've delivered um, and how instrumental you were in, in bringing that file in um, is, is uh, invaluable. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Karen, do you have any um, insights that you would like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, there's so much you can say on this topic, and I'm a big believer in um, Sarah's point, women amplifying other women's voices and just sort of being the cheerleader. Um, it can be done informally over chit-chat. It can be done going into a meeting where you sort of, um, before the meeting, have a little pre-meeting briefing and say, hey, you know, I'm going to specifically praise you for an event <laughs> or something that you've done. And it sounds like it's, it, it's you know, a, a bit of an echo chamber, but I've seen it work. I've really seen people um, pay attention when that sort of um, amplification happens in a group setting or a meeting and, and informally as well. And I guess as, as lawyers and financial advisors, um, who work in the insolvency industry, we um, have an opportunity to interact with women who are also in partnerships or in other similarly structured organizations. So I was really interested to hear what Eileen had to say about FTI. But I do think, you know, in comparison to like a GC at a big corporation, I think um, women lawyers and women FAs sometimes um, swim in the same pool to a certain extent and have many of the same struggles. So I do find that um, when I'm referring work out to an FA, um, I will, you know, obviously make sure it goes to the best person, but if there's an opportunity to refer it to uh, a woman where both candidates, um, a male and female, are equally qualified, I certainly do that and, and I do that because I know that the, the woman FA might be facing the same organization. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, I th that's a perfect segue to, um, to ask Aline to um, comment as well um, in both her role as a financial advisor and also as an insolvency practitioner um, that retains lawyers. Yeah, so for, for me, um, it is important in, in when I when I select lawyers, uh, it is quite important that that particular lawyer gets the recognition and services me in that sense uh, directly. So it, it is especially my part of the world. It's about building very long term relationships, and I have I personally have never encountered. Uh, a situation where um, if I 
approach a particular lawyer, it goes to someone else. And for me to to receive that proper recognition or to ensure that my network receives that proper that that recognition as well, it's about understanding each other in the very long run. And what I've also found out and realized that these are lawyers who have been with me over uh, I've worked with or ever since I was an associate. So we know each other quite well over the years. So it's a very long term. Uh, relationship that I have built really o- and that took over a decade. So those relationships, once you build it, it's very difficult to break. And anybody who, who tries to so-called claim credit from outside that network, it's, it's really going to be quite challenging. And I think there is, there is some value or truth or wisdom in this. Uh, women tend to give women work and we tend to look after um, each other as well. So I um, and and we I guess there's this silent worker um, uh, silent worker B kind of uh, impression that that women female practitioners and lawyers tend to tend to get. So for me, I do as as a, a FA female FA, I do get um, you know it, probably some uh, uh, would I say inferiority complex, but you you feel like when you go into a meeting, you're already at a at a at a you know losing a battle, you probably lost half the battle because firstly of perhaps uh, my age as well because I'm under I'm under forty, and the very senior practitioners in uh, in my side of the world they are they are much more senior than than I am. Then of course being a female that that's against me, but I think so long as you know where your principles are, how you always service your clients, how you brand yourself you will eventually get that recognition. And I think nobody can take that away from you in the long run. Thanks, Aline. That is that is so helpful. And and I think really I'd love to keep going with you on, um, you know, one of, I think everyone would love to hear some tips from each of you on um, how you've looked at building your business um, and, um, what else that you can do to sort of bring in new business um, and um, in addition to just making sure you get the credit for what you actually do? Uh, well, maybe I'll start. It's Karen. Um, in terms of tools that we use, I guess there's um, there's the navigating internal politics, right? So there's there's our internal networks, and then there's the external tools, which are the external networks that Aline was talking about. And I absolutely echo her sentiments. It, it's a it's a long game, and it's a relationship building exercise. And it's it's tough in the first part of your career when you are trying to build your reputation and build your relationships and and working really hard. Um, Origination credit isn't maybe one of the things that's top of mind, frankly, when you're at, you know, in the first 10 years of your practice. But it should be, because frankly, I think it is for for many men, um, and that's where I think that um, internal politics plays its plays out. Um, it, in many of the firms I've been with, it's it's a real scramble when the file is opened. Um, to see who gets the origination credit. And then there's also that um, negotiation that happens, if, if, I, if I can call it that, um, to see you know, um, whether there should be a splitting of the origination credit. And that all comes down to relationships and power dynamics. But I do think that, um, in my experience, sometimes the men are more quick out of the gate to claim that origination credit. And then once it's done at the outset of a file, it's it's very difficult to, um, to bring a different um, recognition to your contribution. Um, the way Sarah described it sounds, sounds great, but in my experience, it doesn't always play out. And then finally, in terms of external tools, um, you know, I really do think that more and more um, opportunities are available for women professionals to utilize um, formal uh, metrics and studies. More and more studies are coming out. Data is very important to, to bring to the table so that, you know, you're not telling people that this is just the right thing to do, but it, you have to bring the business case as well. So things like the Equity Project, um, women's professional groups like I work 
are things that I'm really interested in leveraging um, over the next little while and, and seeing how they play out. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about how you look at um, is sort of the market and where you can, where you, you know, what insights that you've used to help you look at and see where new business is coming from? Sure. Um, you know, I, I always tell everybody, and I think this is consistent with some of the things that Karen said, that my career has been a bit of a continuum, um, and I think we've all probably found this. So when I was a young lawyer, the basis of my career was to figure out how to be the very best lawyer that I could be. Um, and then I had to learn how to look forward and figure out how to run the case and see the bigger picture. And then finally, I had to look, figure out how to look forward and see what was coming down the pipe. And what I, what I realized very quickly, and this is, I think, consistent with what Karen said, is that men had spent a lot of time building relationships at things that, quite frankly, were kind of male-dominated. They went to baseball games together. They went to, um, you know, to watch basketball and hockey and, and whatever the case may be. Um, and I realized that I needed to figure out how to build those relationships as well so that I could sort of see down the pipe where the work was going to come from. And so I, I did that in a couple of ways. One, I really started to build out my relationships with women, um, but two, I found other professionals, regardless of gender, um, who were similarly focused, who um, had similar interests to mine, and really learned how to sort of build on those relationships and work collaboratively to figure out what was coming um, and to sort of look at the marketplace and say, uh, you know, oil and gas. Uh, I'll tell you, I've been doing oil and gas cases um, since before it was crazy. Um, and it was because I was fortunate enough to work with a couple of people who looked at the market and said, we don't think this can last. Um, and so I think it really is all about building those relationships and figuring out how to work collaboratively to figure out where the next piece of business is coming from and, and how you can complement each other. Um, you know, maybe one time it's you're referring a financial advisor in and the next time they're referring you in and as you sort of build those relationships, um, incredibly helpful for figuring out where the next, next piece of work is coming from. Yeah, so I think Sarah, that that's you don't incredible. Mind. Oh yeah, please. Sorry, I, I, I just wanted to share with you what um, FDI has done uh, to, to build that collaborative um, environment. And it, it really is quite useful for women. I think the advice um, I would give women professionals uh, would generally be, you know where your value is and divide and conquer. So what we do quite well in the firm, because we have so many service lines, we specialize in so many different um, subsections, we acknowledge and we respect each other's specialty, uh, where we refer work to another service line. The other service line also um, tries. So we keep we keep a lookout for each other as an entire firm. Uh, we also acknowledge that, for example, corporate finance and restructuring, we are the work givers, so to speak. However, the other service lines, they are more work takers because they just don't have the ability to refer work to lawyers. So that's how we um, collaborate together to make sure that our relationships with the lawyers are strengthened by working together as a pack. So that divide and conquer strategy works quite well for us. Thanks, Aline. That is really interesting. And I guess raises a question for me that I'd love to ask Sarah and Karen about their firm experiences on whether um, they feel like the origination credit system um, encourages collaboration across lawyers or across groups at their firms um, and, and whether there have been, you know, an evolution um, of, and if, if, if not, um, you know, what, what can firms do to, to change that and um, if so, you know, what sort of driven some of the evolution around how credit is awarded? Um, Karen, can I start with you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you great. Great. Okay, I just switched my phone, so I hope that's a little bit clearer. Um, yeah, in in my experience, um, you know, every firm is different, obviously, but it it sort of feeds into the whole diversity and inclusion debate, right? Um, women are a part of the diversity and inclusion metric because um, women, you know, um, represent a major- minority um, in most law firms. So what I see working is is bringing these things out of the shadows, frankly, um, because for years, origination credit, at least in most of my experience, has been very secretive, really. Um, and the partners um, don't necessarily want to open the kimono, as I <laughs> rather crudely say, and sort of show all of their, their internal workings and secrets, necessarily. Um, and the boys' club doesn't necessarily want to let the girls in on all the secrets as well. So um, what I see making a difference is when we start getting, you know, hard data, we start getting metrics, we start getting some of these studies, like the one you referenced early, Emily. I like the slide where you say um, GCs basically say um, they don't ask and the firms generally don't tell. So we sort of know the history of those sorts of uh, policies um, in many institutions, the don't ask, don't tell policies, and um, they um, all disappear when hard data comes out and, and the hard light of day is, is shined on these, on these issues. So I really think, frankly, um, the business case that includes studies, you know, in the UK they did that big study on the wage gap for women lawyers and professionals. And that's what started to drive change in those firms. So I really think that's what it's going to take. And we're at a really exciting moment, I think, um, in history for um, women lawyers and professionals because some of these studies and external drivers are, are really going to, I think, change the way law firms and other professional firms work. Thanks, Karen. Um, Sarah, I think in the response to the first question, you mentioned that things had at Aiken had um, evolved. And I wonder if you could share some insights on, um, it, you know, how women collaborated with leadership to um, evolve how credit is awarded. Sure. So, first of all, we're, we're really fortunate um, in that our current chairperson is a woman. Um, and so I feel like that has been incredibly helpful. Um, as things have have evolved, when I first became a partner, um, we had a male chairperson who was a very nice man, um, but had been there for a very very long time, um, as had much of the leadership, and there frankly hadn't been hadn't been a lot of change, um, and so um, what we have seen. Um, over the last, you know, five to seven years is um, an acknowledgement of the importance of women in firm leadership, not just at the chairperson level, but on compensation committee, management committee, audit committee, um, other things like that. And I think that has sort of helped pull the curtain back um, and um, and shine a light on, on how origination credit um, is awarded, um, which has allowed women to have better insight into what's going on. And I think, um, you know, look, every single one of you on this phone is bright and intelligent and capable of navigating the market um, if you know what the plain rules of the road are. Um, and this has, has allowed those rules of the road to be sort of shared or, or disclosed in a in a more vibrant way. The other thing that I think is is important is um and it's been certainly been important for me, um, is thinking about as women and, and we know this happens disproportionately as women have left private practice and gone in house, um, we've learned how to how to leverage that. And I think this goes to what, what Karen was saying, you know, Women are starting to to say, I'm now in a position where I can award work, and if there are two equally qualified people, I'm going to make sure that the woman 
um, has the opportunity. Um, and so they're sort of reaching back down and, and pulling other women up. Um, I also think that that's starting to happen more internally at firms, <coughs> pardon me, where whereas before there was sort of a sense of, um, and, and certainly we've all seen this, well, I, I worked the all-nighters and I, I did all of these you know, very difficult things and you need to do this too in order to get to the upper echelon, in order to get the credit. And I think now we're seeing women recognizing that that, frankly, was not beneficial to anybody. It wasn't creating the change that we all wanted to see. Um, and so rather, it was far more important that we were reaching down and ensuring that our teams were staffed with very capable people and that, um, you know, we were seeing women get the insight into into what was going on so that they could navigate the system better. Thank you. That That's incredibly helpful. Um, talking about, um, you know, talking a little bit more and, and, and sort of picking up on the theme of the equity project study, um, can each of you give an example of um, if you if you have one that comes to mind of uh, working with um, uh, outside with a client to make sure you know to to make sure that they understand um, how credit is awarded and ensuring that um, you're getting the credit that's due when you're opening the file. You know we have a couple of questions from the audience and they they tend to they do I think really revolve around um, really sort of opening a file and um, you know how you how you've navigated that um, both internally and externally. Um, Aline, could we start with you? Hi, sorry, I was on. Uh, you may be on. Um, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry. So. Um, I I have been really quite fortunate in the in 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 FTI um, and this this change here uh, that recognizes diversity. So diversity is a huge topic uh, for for the firm this year, um, and and this is also the the reason for that is because the women ratio at the top is is actually quite low and they are doing everything that they can uh, to to assist women get up there to take on uh, to to be senior managing directors um, in terms of how this would assist us the the equity project I think the answer is it is it's a, a vote of confidence that we can do it that somebody out there is looking out for us so it is things like that that give women the the boost that they need, the recognition that they need, um, to and the confidence that they need to be able to take on huge files uh, and to take on more risk. So without this aid, I would also being a bit more risk averse if I were to take on certain positions, for example, I would need to gather a bit more support within the firm to also show that I can able I am able to deliver. Uh, whether deliver on on whether can I take on such a file. So with this this additional with this boost, I think it does give women that level of confidence. Great, thank you. Um, Karen, do you can you think of any examples where um, you may have had to fight for credit in a, a file over the opening of a file, or um, you know, and, and have engaged with your client to make sure that you get credit, um, you know, that that the file is opened in a way, and they're directing the credit um, to you having been the person that won the business or principally responsible for winning the business? Oh, boy. How much time do you guys have? <laughs> there are um, so many stories I could tell, but, uh, you know, 
every every file is different. Oftentimes, frankly, I try to take the long view that you know, if you if you lose the battle over one file, you're going to be more um, aware and prepared for the next one because there's always a next file, right? And and you always have to pick pick and choose your battles. The one example I did want to talk about though was one where not where I was. Um, you know, um, having a little bit of an internal battleground. But I remember one time I referred a file to um, a woman financial advisor who was not a partner but was fairly senior because I did want to give her that external recognition, that 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 boost of confidence that Aline was talking about. Um, and to, to my dismay, although, you know, I gave it to her and I was checked with her that she got the origination credit, she started sort of disappearing from the file and she wasn't coming to meetings anymore and she wasn't on email lists. And, you know, I actually had to call it, call it out and say, well, wait a minute, um, where, where is this woman and what happened to her? And basically, you know, the men had tried to push her off the file and I had to speak out about it. And uh, then they quite sheepishly, you know, made sure that she was front and center again, but you have to keep your eye on the ball. And sometimes when you're in the middle of a file, it's it's hard to to notice sort of who's on all the email strings and and who's at all the meetings, but you, it's 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 something that you know you have to keep your eye on during the course of the file. Thanks, Karen. That is um, incredibly helpful, and I think you know something that it, you know we really haven't touched on to date is is you know really making sure that we're looking out for women in that specific way and and what you know people do get sidelined and, and making sure that people are staying on track um sarah we had a question really about you know sort of more specific to the committee practice area and, and um and maybe you know you can take yourself back to associate days um and um you know winning pitching and, and trying to win committee work um and making sure that you're um getting credit there where maybe you're still you know an associate or junior partner and um and origination rules may you know really sort of direct that credit towards somebody more senior and i'm not sure whether you had an experience like that you could share um but um it is certainly a question that's come up and and certainly reminds me of my younger days in practice um of you know really feeling like you do do a lot of the work to to win something um, and then don't get any of the credit. Sure, um, and and it definitely is an issue that I think comes up in particular um, when you are arriving through the ranks. Um, not every firm, I assume, has this, but you know, at our firm, only partners can open files, and so you bring a piece of work in as a you know senior associate um, who's trying to make partner. And lo and behold, some partner has to open it for you because you don't have the ability to open the file. Um, and so I think what becomes really critical there is um, who you partner with, um, no pun intended. Um, you know, I, I was really fortunate to have several really fantastic mentors um, throughout my career and, and who it was evolved um, depending upon what I was working on. But knowing that you're partnering with someone who truly has your your long-term success um, at, at um, you know front and center means that when it comes time to talk about um, who really brought that file in that they should be singing your praises um, and that comes from developing long relationships frankly with the people that you work with it comes from finding people who, um, you know, who you work well with, who want to see you succeed. Um, and, you know, I think we can all tell stories, which like Karen, I, I giggled a little bit when she said, how long do you have? Because I could tell you a hundred stories about when, you know, maybe I felt like I didn't, at least in the immediate term, get the credit that was due and owing as it related to a particular file. Um, you know, and I think that there are a few things that you do. One is who you partner with. Um, two is making sure that to the extent you can, using external resources to ensure that 
um, those inside the firm understand how important you were to bringing the file in. Um, and then the third is, is frankly speaking up, and that's something that as women we're less inclined to do. Um, we're less inclined to, to toot our own horn. I think we've all seen, um, you know, in, in self-evaluations that a man and a woman could have done basically the same same work, whether it was in bringing in the file or, or the actual service work on a file. And when you read the man's description of what he did, um, it will be um, substantially more glowing um, oftentimes than the women's description of, of what she did. And I think we have to learn, particularly as it relates to origination credit, how to get past that and how to make sure that we're, we're telling others that this, you know, we feel like we were important in bringing and bringing this particular piece of work in. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a number of in-house people on um, that are on the call. And I, I guess one question would be, um, you know, sort of is, is there, are there things that you think that um, in-house Council could do either individually or try to sort of push as a policy matter in house that would um, that would be helpful for helping you know to support driving change and supporting you know women um, and diversity in hiring outside council. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the top, our studies show that there's really a broad range of view of views on where companies are um, from everywhere from having very thorough um, vetting of firms um, and very specific targets um, and to sort of a very hands-off approach and a lot of things in the middle of diversity is important to me, but we don't have any specific policies. We don't have any specific guidelines. Um, you know, are there things that in your experience you've found helpful or you think would be particularly helpful um, and it, it for for um, in-house folks to to do to help support um, change. Um, Karen, can I can I ask you to start? Yeah, that's a tricky one, Emily. Honestly, um, you know, uh, I think some clients uh, might feel that they really don't want to delve in too deep um, into the inner workings of the law firm. Um, so you'd have to be really sensitive of, about that. It's like, I don't really want to know how the sausage is made, right? Um, on the other hand, there are clients who are, are definitely making um, diversity inclusion or, you know, um, issues surrounding race and gender, something that is a defining part of their business practice and they want their, you know, legal service providers to reflect those values. Um, I know personally, I've definitely had conversations with some of my um, banking clients, for instance, and asking them, you know, um, about how the work is, is delivered. But to be honest, in many times, um, people just sort of say, oh, well, it depends on the file, it depends on the person, and are reluctant to sort of commit themselves to an overarching mm -hmm. method. You know, so uh, honestly, in my experience, I don't think I've been that successful in getting clients to commit to um, a, a real standard uh, in this sense. It's very case case specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think that reflects, the, you know, the feedback that we got in the study as well. Um, Sarah or Aline, do you have any thoughts on, on this? Yeah, this yes, is Sarah. I, I mean, I, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, go ahead. I think that, that to the extent that you're able to leverage again people who have left your organization and have gone in house, um, I find that that is the most successful way to um, sort of leverage ensuring proper origination credit. Um, primarily because those people hopefully have some idea of how your system works. I agree with Karen that it's it's much trickier um, when it's someone who is has never been inside your organization. Um, you may find yourself with an external advocate who is unhappy that 
that you didn't receive origination credit, but it's very difficult for them um, to, to necessarily change that at the, at the outset um, because they don't necessarily know um, what was happening. But I, I do think um, when you've got someone who's gone in-house, they do have the ability to say, and, and oftentimes will, I've found, say, I'm sending this to your firm with the understanding that person XYZ will be opening the file and will be working on the file. If that's not correct, then you know, I need to know because it may change how I allocate how I allocate my legal dollars or my legal spend. Um, but again, that's a very small um, group of people who are able to sort of make that very assertive statement. I, I tend to agree with Karen that I think it's a it's a difficult avenue. Mm -hmm. Elaine? Yeah, so on my Fontify, um, I, I can, I'll draw parallels with what FTI went through. So FTI has, in, in the Singapore market, has always been, uh, or initially when it first set up in Singapore back up about eight years ago, it was perceived to be a foreign foreign firm, uh, and it was very difficult to win work from local banks, and that was one space that we really wanted to break into. Uh, I mean, of course, the banks wouldn't tell you straight in the face that, oh, you're too foreign or there are not enough locals, but when you hear enough chatter in the market as to why we're just simply not winning work from them, uh, there was a the business case to really start looking at hiring more locals. I mean, of course, that, that, I mean, I benefited from, from that insight. And that's why we drawing parallels from there. I think if there are more banks that are asking questions about diversity, for example, and more clients asking these questions, they do see a business case. And the firm will slowly eventually evolve its ways as well because there is a business case to be made. And um, seeing how, how our firm has changed and evolved and tried to adapt over, over the years, I mean, that's encouraging for me to know that at some point, the question whether what's your your gender ratio, that, that will be one of the top questions that a client will ask. Thanks. That, that's very helpful. And I think, um, you know, I think each of you has really um, emphasized the point of, of having the data and making the business case being, you know, an important part of, um, advocacy um, um, for diversity without necessarily, you know, really making it about the business case more than the moral case, I think, um, you know, really helps, um, for lack of a better term, maybe depoliticize um, the issue and, and, and make the best business case. Um, um, I, you know, that's, that's an incredibly helpful insight. Um, I think that that's really come out of the panel today. Um, we are coming up on the hour, and um, I think we've touched on most of the questions that we had from the audience. Um, if anyone has a question, um, we can submit it on the Q&A tab, but um, we are sort of coming up on the hour. So um, I think, barring any last minute questions, we I will send it back over to Susie to wrap up, but before I do, I, I just really like to um, thank um, Aline, Karen, and um, and Sarah for their time and incredibly um, helpful um, and practical and specific insights um, on this topic, which is you know continues to vex women um, after all of this time, and and you know it does seem like there's slow change in the right direction um, and you know, really how they've been able to navigate the system um, and, and share those insights with, with everyone on the call. It, it, it's so appreciated and I think so helpful. I hope um, our audience has taken um, a lot of, of great insights away from the panel today. I know I have. Thank you all so much. And thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone for attending. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you found this presentation helpful and we encourage you to reach out to any of us with any follow-up questions. You can either email our speakers directly or you can email Burford at info at burfordcapital.com. 
As previously mentioned, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to the archived webcast, and if you would like the deck, please just email us your request. We hope to see you at another Bertha briefing in the near future. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.